Yeah, OK. So uh, Zyberk is a, a Ruby library that uh, provides auto-loading, reloading, and eager loading for Ruby projects. And in case your OCD is suffering a lot right now because auto-loading is one word and eager loading is two words, I feel your pain because <laughs> that's the way it is. <laughs> but uh, that is how uh, current Rails applications uh, do these things using Zyber behind the scenes. And Perhaps if you are new to Rails, you do not even notice because transparency has been like a, a key design goal of this library. What does, what, what does that mean is that your Ruby code has no trace on Zyberk. So you write your normal application code, Zyberk is nowhere to be seen. Even more, there are several hundred gems uh, nowadays loading with Zyberk. So perhaps some of your dependencies are using Zyberg as well, and you do not even notice, because transparency also is translated to the user of the code, in this case of, the, of libraries. So it's, it does not belong even to the public interface. The gem may say, uh, to use this gem, uh, you know, load this entry point. It doesn't even publish that is using Zyberg internally. All right? So transparency has been a goal. It's nowhere Zyberg to be seen. Um, however, uh, this, ha this does not have to be magic. I don't like the word magic, okay? So I want this user experience, but uh, when you use the library, if you know what it's doing, I, instead of magic, I like to talk about uh, enhancing something, accelerating something about catalysts, all right? That's the point, that the library is going to do something that you could perhaps manually do, but it's done for you. It's a catalyst, OK? So your, your user experience, I, I believe, is better if you are interested into that. If you know, in addition to the features that you get, how it, it is doing that, all right? So this is what the talk is about. Now, uh, Dybrick is, uh, you, you can think of that uh, library as a code loader. All right? But technically, it's a constants loader. All right? So in order to understand how Zyberg works, uh, we need to be more or less on the same page about certain key aspects of constants in Ruby. So we are going to have two sections in this talk. The first section is that we put in common these uh, observations. And then the second section is the proper thing about understanding how the uh, Zyberg is implemented, but we need the first one first. So the first thing is that the class and module keywords create constants. They store the, the classes and modules that get defined in constants. This is a very unique thing in the Ruby programming language. So for instance, we have here two chunks of code. The first one, the normal one, class C, you define a class, call it C. But this, the class keyword here, is doing what the ch second chunk is doing. You create a class object, class.new, and assign that object to the C constant. That is what's happening behind the scenes in the class keyword. Same for modules. If we define a module called M, that's the same thing as creating a module object and assigning that object to a constant, the constant, the M constant. All right? So, this is linked to the second remark. Very important, Ruby does not have syntax for types. There's no syntax for types. So let's just study for a moment this slide, right? Simple slide. We, we got zero into x, the x constant. And after that, we say, are you even? Yes. OK. Let's, let's see what's happening in detail here. We are storing zero into an x constant. And then we ask that x constant if it's even. What is happening there is that x is an expression. The expression evaluates to the value that it contains, like it would happen in a variable. Same thing, right? So x, which is your value? Zero. OK, zero. Zero responds to even, question mark. So we get the thing. This slide, I believe, is not surprising to anyone. It's what we expect. Now, the next slide. The next slide is very important in the presentation, which is that 
when we write something like this, project dot find something, that project is a constant. That's the point. Okay. When we define this closet, this project, let's assume is a is a class. Okay. When we define with class keyword, there's a constant project created as we saw before, and a class object is stored in the constant. So that is a constant. It's not a type. This is, this is a very important technical detail to understand how Zyber works. So that project is exactly the same as this X. It's a constant, regular constant. There's nothing special about that. All right. The next remark is that constants belong to class and module objects. And this is the way Ruby kind of emulates the concept of a naming space. So, Class and module objects have internally, you can think conceptually as a hash table, a constant table that maps constant names to their values. And in the case of top level constants, in which class or module object are stored in object. All right? So, the module class has this uh, API to manipulate this constant table. You can set constants, you can get constants, remove constants, list constants, okay? There's an API that reflects this model, okay? The model in which these things have this collection inside. For instance, when we define C, the class C, we saw <clears throat> before that we are creating a constant. If we list the constants of object, we see the C constant included there as a symbol, is the name. All right. Now, this C is listed among other things. Why do we have ellipses there? Because there's no types. So, so when we write a string, for instance, capital S, that is not a type, that's a constant. It's a top-level constant, therefore belongs to object. Hash, same thing. All right? So, if, if we see the actual listing here, it would include all these things, all right? We only highlighted C here. Now, I want us to see the same thing, but now using the API, which is the third chunk in the, in the slide. So, uh, these three things, basically, uh, as far as this talk is concerned, they are doing the same thing. They are creating a class object and storing that class object in the C constant, in object because it is top level. Okay, so in the last one, concept is creating a constant in the receiver. So the second argument is the value. So the second argument is class new, new class object, stored in the C constant that belongs to object, the receiver. Is this, the three things are doing the same. Now let's go and introduce nesting here. All right, we have a top level module M and nested, we have class C. This is the, the emulation of namespaces because that, cl that class C is in the M namespace we think about. So if we list the constants in this slide, in object we have M. That's the top level one. But C is not there. C is in the constants of M. Okay, we have created a C constant in the M module. So whenever we find a constant in a, in a Ruby listing, we have always to think this constant, okay, where, where, where is this constant stored? In which class or module object? Which name space we could, we could think, all right? Since there are lookups, uh, Ruby searches, you know, uh, in certain places that we are not going to see because it is not relevant to this presentation. So again, let's expose us to this API. So this is the same thing using the API, all right? We create a module object in the first line, assign that module object to the M constant in object, which means a top level M. In the second line, we already can refer to M. How is that possible? We do not have a module keyword. We do not say, we do not do a constant assignment with the equal sign. Yes, we can refer to that because there's nothing else. It's constants stored in class and module objects. So that M, Ruby says, well, I have a constant here. I am going to look up this constant in certain places. One of them is object. Since we just created that constant in object, it's found. So we can call concept on that thing 
and create the class. So this code is doing the same thing that the first chunk is doing, the same thing, only using the API. Now, the last remark is a, call, uh, a method called autoload in module, all right? This allow you to, allows you to load constants on demand. So let's see an example. This is a real example from, from background. If you open the uh, entry point of background, you will see that it defines uh, a namespace, background, and then it says autoload action with this string. The thing here is that um, whenever you use background colon colon action or you want to access that constant some way in, you know, in background or in client code, if the constant is already in place, normal, but if it's not, it's going to trigger this autoload and it's going to issue a require on the second argument. So it's going to do require background slash action and if when that require returns, if everything is normal, the constant is going to be defined and the, the, you know, the, the point that triggered the autoload resumes and continues execution. This is done on the fly by Ruby itself. So why does background do this? Well, one of the benefits of this is that you no longer have to put requires in your code because Ruby is going to autoload on demand, okay? And that, that is why we do not need to put requires in Rails applications because Zyber is based precisely on this API. Now, again, let's, let's look at the same thing from a different perspective. This is doing the same thing, but explicitly, all right? Because in the previous slide, uh, autoload is a method, a method that is receiving two uh, arguments and is invoking in which receiver in self, who is self in the body of a module, the module, all right? So this is the same thing. The module, autoload, the name of the constant, and a string to be required, all right? Okay, so we are ready to see how Zybrick works. Now, the next slides, are, the code that we are going to see is heavily, heavily edited, okay? Because, uh, well, the library is not, is not big. It's like 1,000 lines or something like that. But there's way more stuff uh, that, we are, that what we are going to see, more details. But the essential ideas is what we are going to know. And that's the context that, that they would like people to have in mind when they use the library uh, if they want to know how it's, how it's implemented. These are the key ideas, all right? So this is the way you uh, create a loader using the generic API. The generic API is, super, is, is very simple. You instantiate an object, and then you say, uh, push these directories. Those directories represent the top level namespace by default. So in this case, this is, this is handmade, okay? We are pushing app controllers, app models, no, nothing else, two only, all right? And that is saying, okay, this, please track these directories and they represent the top level namespace. What does that mean? It means that if you have app models user.rb, since app models represents the top level namespace, that means that user.rb represents the top level constant user with capital U. That's, that, that what, that's what it means. Now, once you have configured these, these uh, root directories, you call setup, and in, in the next line, you can use anything in your project. There's nothing else to do. So what does setup do? Let's see first an example. We are going to see what we are going to do first with concrete example, okay? So let's imagine that our project has app controllers, users controller, and then there's an admin namespace with a roles, uh, roles controller. Then in models, we have user and admin role. Let's, let's work with this particular example, all right? Now, what Zyberg is going to do for us is super simple. It's going to define autoloads for these things. Only one level, only one level. So it does not descend to the admin namespace. It sets three autoloads. 
one for users controller, one for user, and one for admin. So whenever you refer to users controller, if it's not loaded, it's going to be loaded thanks to this thing that Zyber has done for you. How is that done? It's simple. We iterate through these root directories. This is the implementation. And we call this method that says basically, please define the, out the necessary autoloads in this directory, taking into account that uh, we are now in this namespace. So this directory represents this namespace. A namespace is a class or module object, okay? Now, the root namespace we can assume is object. Could be something else, but at this point, we are going to iterate through app controllers and app models. There's two iterations, and the namespace, the second argument is object, all right? Now, we are going to, this is what happens with one of them, all right? One iteration. We have this ls internally. There's this ls. There's a lot of private APIs here. It doesn't matter. This ls utility basically yields to the block only things that are of the concern of the loader. It's going to be either Ruby files with RB extension or directories. Anything else is ignored. So for instance, you can have JavaScript files in the same directory if you want. You can have uh, .ds story macOS. It's going to be ignored, right? It's fine. Now, since we have removed you know, all the things that are not interesting, if we get into the block, we are in two situations. Either we got a file or we got a directory. Now, let's branch. Let's see what happens with files and what happens with directories. With files, we camelize the name. So if we got user.rb, we camelize user lowercase to get camel case. That gives us user with capital U. That's the C name variable, okay? Constant name. That inflector thing is, it's a inflector that, that uh, has the loader and it's independent of any other inflector that can be, uh, you know, affecting other loaders. Each loader has its own independent deterministic inflector. Now, look at the second line. That's the autoload call. That's what we saw in the example. That is what background does. But Zyberg is doing, uh, doing it for us. So we say, Name space, object in this case, okay? Object, autoload user with this absolute path to user.rb. Why an absolute path? Zybert has performance always in mind. If you pass an autoload path to require, there's no lookup in the load path, in the load paths, okay? So if you pass an absolute path, require goes straight to the file, right? And then we do some housekeeping. We remember the autoloads that we have set. That's the third line. We, out, we remember this one, these ones. And then there's an internal registry that says, this loader self is responsible for this path. We are going to see later why do we need this. So simple. We camelize, set the autoload, and store some state in the loader for future use. Simple. Now, with directories, there's a little bit more to, of things to do, but not a lot. Same thing, we camelize, and a namespace, as you know, can be spread in multiple di directories. In our example, admin is in two places, right? It's below app controllers and below app models, but they represent the same namespace, the, the top level admin namespace. So we might find admin multiple times, okay? So if this is, this is the first time we find it, same thing, we set an autoload. Object autoload admin, capital A, with this absolute path, okay? The absolute path is going to be the absolute path to a directory, which is something a little bit weird, but we are going to understand later why we do this. Same housekeeping, we keep the autoloads uh, that we are setting, uh, we call, we register that we are managing this directory. And then we keep track of all the, these several admin, you know, uh, directories in the last collection, namespace dears, all right? So 
in the loop, in the initial loop that we have, we first visit APP controllers and we say, okay, there's an admin here. First time, okay, set an auto load and remember that we have an admin directory here. Now, in APP models, there's also admin. The, the unless is going to be skipped, and, but we keep track of that second admin. So that namespace, this, in the case of admin, is going to have two entries, right? That is all that is set up. So let's recap. The loader has a scan. The root directory is only one level, only one level. Zyberg is as lazy as possible always. Now, at this point, the autoloads have been defined, but they have not been triggered. There's nothing loaded, only the autoloads, only that slide that we saw with the three autoloads. That is what has happened, that and some internal state. Now, the setup call at this point returns, and the loader stops and waits, does nothing else. Now, with this, we are able to load the entire project in the next line. How is that possible? Well, the autoloads are triggered on demand. When you refer to one of those constants that you have an autoload for, then Ruby is going to trigger the autoload Ruby. So the, the actual autoloading is performed by Ruby, which is something made on purpose because uh, that's built in in the interpreter. It respects the, uh, the, the lookup algorithms and everything. It's built in in Ruby. So we are using this key feature in Ruby. So they are triggered by Ruby when the constant is referenced, as we saw before. So that's the opportunity that we have to keep track of things being autoloaded because there's a thin wrapper around require. When at an autoload is triggered, Ruby is going to require the second argument, right? So we intercept that. That's what Zyber does. And here we, you can see the registry used. Okay, remember we have a registry that says this loader is managing this path. So the first thing we ask is, is there any loader uh, lo um, responsible for this? Let's imagine we are loading Nokogiri, for instance. Nokogiri is not managed. All right, then we go to the else clause. So this is not managed by Zyberg, no problem. Uh, call the original required done, All right? Now, the interesting part is when we are managing, so we get the loader that is loading this, and we need to do this because maybe there are seven of them. Okay? We need to know which one of them, that's the registry about. Again, we need to branch. If this is a file, we are going to do something. If it's a directory, we are going to do something else. The file part is quite simple. Uh, First of all, we call the original require. So anything that Ruby has to do with this file, please do it, okay? We are delegating the work to Ruby. Then if the file was actually loaded, we are going to do some housekeeping, and finally, we are going, we are going to return the same flag to comply with the contract of require. Now, what is that housekeeping? Super simple as well. Autoloads is that collection where we store the autoloads that have been set. The first thing that we do is delete that entry from that collection. So that collection grows as we set autoloads and then rings as autoloads are being used. Okay, it's dynamic, it grows and it rings. So it, it tries to keep memory low, right? Only the necessary information is stored. Now we check was the constant that we expected actually loaded? If it wasn't, we raise an error, fine. But if it was loaded, we continue. No, reloading by default is disabled in Zyberg. Okay? You have to enable reloading uh, if you want to reload. So in the case that reloading is enabled, then we keep track of the things that have to be unloaded. And that's the if, con the if um, condition there, all right? That to unload hash is keeping track of this and is storing the information that is going to be necessary to unload. Now, directories. We saw how, what happens when you refer to user, for instance, okay? There's a require and happens what we saw. Now, if you refer to the admin namespace, 
the wrapper is even thinner, all right? So only this housekeeping is going to happen. And then we return true because we control this. We, we intercept this call. It's, it's, there's no call to the original require because require doesn't, has nothing to do with directories. What happens here? Similar, we delete the entry. So grow and shrink. We delete the entry. And now you see a con set call. We are going to set a call to define the admin module because this admin module does no admin.rb file defining the module. However, when you use the application, when we use the application, the admin module somehow comes to life. How is that? Here is that. So that concept is, is looking like the, like the examples that we saw in the first half of the presentation. So we are creating a module object and storing the module object in the, well, the, the CREF constant reference is that pair that we saw before. It's a pair that has the namespace and the constant name. So the first element, CREF zero, is the namespace, namespace, concept, the const name, and assign this module object that I just created to that uh, thing. So it's object concept admin module new. So in the next line, admin is reachable, admin is created. Now, if reloading is enabled, the same thing, we keep track of things. And then we need to go to the list of directories that conform the name space, and here is the recursion. Here is the recursion. In those directories, we now set autoloads with the same call that we saw at the beginning. Only that now the directory is going to be uh, admin, some, some of the admins, and mod is going to be the module that we just created. So, in admin, the namespace is admin. That's the point. But this is the same call that we saw before. And here's the recursion. So Zyber does one level, and then uh, it only descends to the branches of the project that are used, and only one level at a time, as lazy as possible. So after that code, this is, this is the situation now. We got the module admin defined, and then an autoload for Rollers controller and autoload for Roll. All right. Uh, there's an edge case here because the namespace could be defined in a file. All right. So in this case, hotel RB and hotel pricing dot RB. We cannot load the first one because we need the pricing constant, but we cannot load the second one because we need the hotel constant. How do we solve this? Okay. If we wanted to do this by hand, we could do this, set an autoload there. This is artificial, but we could do this. Okay, this, this would work. Now, Zyberg uh, is not going to edit your files because of transparency. So Zyberg is going to do this without editing the file. And in order to do this, it has a trace point that is enabled if it detects namespaces this way, otherwise it's disabled. It's a trace point on the class event that's cheap. Okay, it's the class event. So this is called when new classes and modules are created with the keywords. Basically, this is doing, okay, hotel. I got hotel, but I have also the list of directories where hotel is defined. So when the hotel class has been loaded, the trace point gives you the class object. And now we can go and do what we saw with directories. We go, we iterate through the directories and say, okay, this directory, the namespace is this, please set the autoloads one level more. So this is the summary, all right? We scan root directories only one level, define autoloads for the entries that we find, then we wait for the autoloads to be triggered. If you don't use the application, nothing is going to happen. If you use it, it's going to be loaded as less as possible. Now, when the autoloads, if the autoloads are triggered, we intercept the requires. And there is where we can do housekeeping. For instance, define module, uh, uh, module objects on the fly, if needed, as we saw with the admin example. And at that point, descend one level, descend in that particular branch of the project. All right, so this is, the main thing in the presentation, how autoloading works and 
which is the state that we keep. Because as you are going to see, reloading and eager loading is just a corollary of all this. So this is the call to reload, simple, uh, reload. What does it do? Ruby does not have API to remove things from memory, all right? So we have to kind of emulate this, and this is where the conventions enter. You, if you follow the conventions, this is going to happen cleanly, all right? So the first thing that we do is we set auto loads. If there's any auto load that has not been triggered, we remove the auto load. Because if you deleted the corresponding file and we do not delete that auto load, in the, after reloading, it, it, it wouldn't make sense. The, the state of the auto loads would not correspond to the state of the file tree. So if you remove the file, we need that file, that, the corresponding auto load to be deleted. So we delete all of the pending ones. Now, the const, the, if reloading is enabled, remember, we keep track of the constants that have been uh, loaded, so we remove those ones. To do this, we use the API, remove const, that API that we saw in module. Then there's a te technicality here because you know that require is idempotent, okay? And when after reloading, we are going to set auto loads and they are going to trigger requires, okay? If user.rb was required in the first place, uh, Require is going to say, I, I already required this thing. There's nothing to do, and the file wouldn't be loaded. So we need to trick a little bit this system by editing loaded features, which is the collection where uh, require looks for to know if something has been already loaded. We need to remove those things by hand, okay? And when we have unloaded these things, in, in principle, if everything is okay, none of those class and module objects are reachable anymore because the constants are gone. So they are going to be eventually garbage collected. Now, we have unloaded the code and we are a square one. A square one is run setup, start again at the root directories. And finally, eager loading also, simple call, eager load. You may think that eager loading is a re recursive require, where it is not by a number of reasons. Uh, and this is a, a, a part of the implementation of Zyberg that uh, I like very much, which is that here you could say that Zyberg is using itself. Because eager loading is not a recursive require. Eager loading is a recursive auto loading. So we do a breadth first project traversal. And since we know which auto loads have not been triggered, when we traverse the, the tree, we say, okay, this file, this has been this uh, triggered? No, we, I have it. So cons, cons get. Cons get is going to auto load. Now, when you auto load, perhaps that file is referring at the top level to other, I don't know, five or six mixins that in turn are going to be auto loaded. But remember, then we remove them from the state of the loader because we ground and, and we shrink. What happens that when we find those files, this thing is going to skip them directly. So it's going only to do this, con this con cons get once, as efficient as possible. So that was it. I hope that this. Um, you know, clarifies at least a little bit how things are working behind the scenes, and that's all I have. All right, thank you.